Welcome to the stage, Ant Middleton. Uh, so those of you that are here during the last tour, I spoke about my upbringing all the way through to my military days. I didn't really touch on my special forces days. I touched on a few bits. I touched on the psychological resilience that it takes to become a special forces operator. And this time, I'm going to talk about the emotional intelligence required to become a special forces operator. A lot of people think that's the physical and the psychological. But when I broke it down and when I look back on my career, the majority of it was emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is pretty simple. It's understanding the emotion for what it is and making it work for you. And I'll say that again, it's understanding the emotion for what it is and making it work for you. Now the intelligent bit is making it work for you. And in order for your emotions to work for you, you have to take control of it. That's the super important bit. When an emotion presents itself and you don't take control of it, it will take control of you. It's simple science. If something doesn't work for you, it works against you. It's like your mind, right? Like I mentioned last time, if your mind doesn't work for you, it's gonna work against you. It's the same with your emotions. If your emotions don't work for you, they're gonna work against you. And I've got some good examples um, from SAS Australia and also some awesome examples from when I was in the military that I'm gonna tell you about. Now, the first half, I'm gonna be talking about my days in the Special Forces and our favorite show, SAS Australia. And yes, there you go. And the second half is going to be exclusive footage for my K2 client. Now, I've got a documentary coming out later this year, probably in about six months' time. So this is raw, real footage that no one has had the privilege of seeing. You are the first. Okay, so the second half, we'll be talking about K2, about the climb, and also how I use emotional intelligence in a different way to get up that climb. Now, I'm going back to my military days. I remember passing, passing out in the Marines, and uh, I went straight out to Afghanistan as a section commander. Now, when I went straight out to Afghanistan, you can imagine as a section commander, as a team leader, I had a lot of responsibility on my shoulders. And that tour, even though it was the, the least kinetic tour, what I mean by the least kinetic tour is the least action that I saw out of my three tours that I'd done in total. It was the most frightening because we lived in mud huts, we lived in FOBs, forward operational bases, which were basically in enemy territory that we, uh, that we managed to obtain and therefore we had to keep it, we had to keep that area. So we were living in mud huts, we were being mortared more or less every single night, you know, not knowing what's coming the next day and also patrolling out of our FOBs. This is where Unfortunately, back in the day, from the 2006 to 2012, a lot of IEDs went off. So, for those of you that have read my books, will know that I dealt with uh, quite a lot of IED uh, casualties, um, you know, picking up body parts of comrades and putting them on a stretcher, etc., etc. So that tour was um, was extremely stressful, and you can imagine the uh, when I got back home, the relief. I remember just getting back home, this complete relief, up to the point where. My wife would leave a couple of hundred quid on the side um, before I even saw my wife and my children. I know this is really bad, but before I saw my wife and my children, I'd grab the money and we'd go out just with the lads and just decompress with, uh, with you know, going out, having a few drinks. Probably not the best thing to do, but I didn't want to bring any of that home. So after I was nursing a hangover, I could uh, maybe compute things a lot better. And that's just the way we've done things in the military. You know, we decompress in that way. There's any way we can really sort of deal with our family life, deal with our social lives, because they're two completely different worlds. And when I got back from Afghanistan on my first tour, um, I went straight to selection. Within a couple of weeks, I was on selection. So I got back into December, on the January, I was on selection. Past selection after the six months. Again, 202 people started my course, eight of us passed. And then I went straight back out of Afghanistan as a special forces operator. I've done six months in Afghanistan, six months selection, back again six months in Afghanistan. And I can remember when I passed selection, it was the biggest joy of my life. I felt invincible. I remember thinking to myself, yes, I'm done. I'm just going to stay in this unit. I'm done for life now. And then two weeks of being assigned to my squadron, the squadron sergeant major came up to me and said, Andrew, you're going to Afghanistan. I can remember this emotion, this feeling in my chest. I'm going to tell you the difference between an emotion and a thought. Now, a thought is engaged up here. An emotion is when you feel it in your soul, basically. Who's lost a child before for a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes? Come on, put your hands up. I know there's fucking a lot more than that out there. I'm one of them. Now, when you turn around and your child's gone, and you're like that, and it's here, 
It's not here because your brain doesn't engage. That's the emotion of fear kicking in. Bang, your heart drops to the floor. That's an emotion. That's when fear really does kick in. You're in the fear bubble right there. That's the emotion that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about being scared of heights and thinking about going up to the top of the mountain or thinking about because the emotion hasn't been exposed. That emotion doesn't really get exposed because our mind plays tricks. Like I'm talking about that raw emotion. And that's what I felt in told me I was going back out to Afghanistan as a flight. I remember thinking to myself, Anne, you've just passed selection. You love your job. It's going through your head. And it was one of those where I thought to myself, wow, I've just got to be honest with myself. And that's the hardest thing to do. In order to be able to control your emotions, you have to be honest with yourself. I had to say to myself, and I was a bit scared, I was a bit worried. Going back out there again, being in that bubble for six months, it was draining, it drained me, drained me psychologically, physically, and emotionally. And I thought, right, I can't let that happen again. So I came up with a very handy concept called the fear bubble. And the fear bubble was something that I sort of worked on on the ground. I thought to myself, the first tour of Afghanistan I'd done, I was in that fear bubble for six months. It's too long. The moment I step foot on the ground in Afghanistan in that fog, I can just remember just being like a cool spring. Constantly on guard, constantly watching out, constantly um, stressed, constant pressure on my shoulders, especially as a team leader. And I thought to myself, I didn't really enjoy the tour, I just got free the tour. But I loved the job that I'd done. So up here, I was loving the job that I'd done, but in here it was telling me, but you need to now harness your emotions. It's no longer a psychological game. It goes from the physical to the psychological, then it goes on to the emotional. And it's the emotional that you really have to take charge of. And it's fear that I had to take charge of. And fear is the number one hurdle that will stop you from achieving and realizing what you're capable of. Fear will limit you massively. The moment fear takes hold, you're done. You will not grow, you will not learn, you will not become a better version of yourself. All fear is, is your body priming itself to step into the unknown. I'm going to say that again to the young man over there. Fear is your body priming itself to step into the unknown. It's your body saying, get ready, get ready, get ready. That's all it is. But when you step into the unknown, you're going to learn something. You're going to grow from it and you're going to understand yourself more. You're going to take layers off that emotion. And every time you repeat that process, the exposure and the repetition, you start to learn more and more how to, how to make that fear work for you. So I thought, I've got to break it down. Like everything in life, not just in the military, everything in life, I had to break it down. So I thought to myself, when I go to Afghanistan, I'm not going to be in this fear bubble. Okay, so I landed, and I remember landing in Afghanistan, I've got the lads around me, I've got my kit on, and walking to my accommodation, but this time I'm in the special forces, so I've got aircon accommodation, I've got nice food, I'm not living in a mud hut. Um, so I thought to myself, I don't need to be in this bubble. So I didn't get into the bubble. I felt way more relaxed, way more switched on, way more sort of good to go. And even when I got out on the ground, I remember thinking, hey, you're a special forces operator. You're highly trained, you know exactly what you're doing. You're better trained than anyone out here. Use that to your advantage. And I can remember getting dropped off on a mission, maybe 12 kilometers from the target. And I'd be walking onto the target, navigating as point man. I was point man, first man through the door. Point man, whole team relying on me, navigating through the mountains. And I remember thinking, I just feel really relaxed. Don't need to be in that bubble. And just, if something happens, I've got the team behind me, we'll deal with it accordingly and we we'll move on. I didn't need to be in that bubble. It really helped me. I remember walking through the mountains feeling really relaxed. I wasn't in that bubble. It really, really helped me. And even when I got to the compound door, now compound door is a huge compound, you have the door, and then within the compound you've got multiple buildings. And we knew the high value target was in the compound, in one of the buildings. So I remember getting, even getting up to the compound, compound door and feeling good to go. It's good to go, I didn't need to worry. Breach the compound door, into the compound, no one heard us coming. It wasn't until I accidentally stood on someone in the courtyard that all hell broke loose. I went through, went through a small, small uh, breaking in the wall, and I stood on someone. They jumped up, and the fucking hell scared the shit out of me, scared the shit out of that person. I had to drop on them, and then all hell broke loose. And um, as it does when you're after HVTs, and everyone ran this time. We didn't. There wasn't really much to do. Everyone just, whoosh, all the enemy just ran. And I was thinking to myself, right, cool. The courtyard's clear. I don't need to be, even, even though I'm in the heights of the mission, I just trod on someone and dealt with it, dealt with the situation, I don't need to be in that fear bubble. But the moment 
I looked at a door. I was like, right, that's where my bubble is. That's when I know, when I'm at that door and I don't know what's behind it, that's when I know this emotion is really going to take charge of me. I can remember when I visualised my emotions, my very visual person, when I visualised that fear, I could step into it and I could step out of it. And that's what I've done. I remember going, going towards the door and seeing a bubble there and just getting in the bubble there. Bang! I'm heightened now. I'm in the fear bubble. I can feel it. Okay? Now what I need to do from here, emotional intelligence, is make a decision. Take control of that emotion. And the only way I can take control of that emotion is to get through the door and take control of it. So that's exactly what I've done. Bang, went through the door, room was clear, I'm out of the bubble. I go back out to the door, look at the next door, courtyard's clear, I make a beeline to the next door. I'm good to go, I put the ladder behind me, I'm good to go, I'm good to go, I'm good to go. Bang, I get up against the door, I'm in the bubble, the bubble's there again, I don't know what's behind that door. Go through the door, engage the enemy, bang, 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 do what we need to do. All corners of the room, room clear. Poof, I'm out of that bubble. I was literally in the fear bubble, I pulled up the fear bubble for seconds, sometimes minutes, but if not seconds. The moment you're in that fear bubble for too long, it will engulf you and it will drain you physically, psychologically and emotionally. Your mind will play tricks on you if you're not in the emotional moment. That's when I knew that I had to get the job done. Get in there, feel it, don't get it engulf me for too long, get through the door, bubble burst. And after that, once I broke it down, fear like that, to bubbles, I call it the fear bubble, then I was running around like a lunatic looking for bubbles. I was like, fucking hell, where's the next bubble? Bang, 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 bang. In a bubble, bang, out of it. I was like, bang, adrenaline from bubble to bubble to bubble. And also, when you come out of that bubble, you're elated. Boom, I'm still here, I'm still alive. Why? I'm capable, I can do it. We're, we're, we're really achieving this mission. And it gives you a heightened sense of uh, feeling to then go to the next bubble, to find the next bubble. And that's exactly what I've done during my second tour and my third tour of Afghanistan. And after that, I was just chasing bubbles. The fear bubble. And it really, really worked. And I thought to myself, do you know what? How can I scale this down into everyday life? And it was a young lad like Will, probably a bit older actually, probably about 15, 16. And um, he texted me, or he DM'd me on Instagram, and I look at my DMs every now and then. And uh, this young man, especially when I get messages like this, this young man said, and I'm really worried about my exams, he's doing his GCSEs, he says, I no longer want to be here. I was like, ah, right. I'm going to have to answer this, because I have to tread really, really carefully now, because this is a really sort of delicate message, but I want to help this young boy. And I said to him, I said, what are you worried about? He said, I'm just scared about my exams, I'm scared I'm going to fail. Fear, fear of failure, fear of not being good enough, fear of the unknown, fear of missing out, whatever it may be, fear of what other people will think of you. I can remember this young boy, I said, what are you scared that I'm going to fail? Fear of failure. Um, he said, what can I do? He said, um, I've worked as hard as I can work, I'm just drained. I thought, I know what you feel like. You know you've put the work in, you're in that bubble now. You're probably at home, he's sat at home and he's in that bubble. It's not the emotion that he's feeling, it's, his mind's playing tricks on him, he's not even in that emotional bubble right now. But he's thinking worst case scenario in his head, your mind plays tricks on you. It's not even, that's not even emotional intelligence, that's not the emotion coming to the forefront of true game, that's your mind playing games on you. I said to him, why are you worried when you're at home? He said, just, just worried about what, what my exam will come out with. I said, you're at home, I said, chill, relax, are you putting the work in? The first thing I said to him is, are you putting the work in? He said, yes. I said, good. I said, so get your heads out of your books. I said, go down, chill with your mum and dad, chill with your grandparents. I said, take the time out and then revise the next day. I said, you don't need to be in that fear bubble. I said, what are you in? You're in a bubble. It's engulfing you, it's draining you physically, psychologically, and emotionally. Um, I said, even when you go to school, even when you wake up in the morning, it's the day of your exams. I said, walk into school, you don't need to be in the fear bubble. I said, walk to school, open the school door, open the classroom door, go and sit down. Bang. I said, you don't need to be in the fear bubble. Even when you get in that classroom, I said, you do not need to be in that fear bubble. I said, however, the moment you turn over that page, boom. I said, go into the bubble. So get into the bubble. I said, go into a bubble, attack the first question in the bubble. I said, get yourself into that bubble, attack the first question. I said, once you finish the first question, I said, come out of that bubble. So just come out of it, take a breath, and attack the second bubble, the third bubble. And he said, Am, why don't I stay in it the whole time? I said, it's too long. I said, I've been there, trust me, it's too long. I said, what if... 
If you're only 80% sure of the first question, so you're going to grab that other 20% over, or that other 15% over, then 5% over. So before you know it, it's going, to, it's going to get to your head and it's going to take charge of you, it's going to control you. And all you're going to do is go into meltdown. So tackle it one question at a time. I said, try that for me. Away he goes, does his exams, um, and he got back to me the day he finished his exams. So I didn't find out what his results were, but the day he finished his, his exams. Um, and he said to me, he said, Andrew, he said, I finished my, my exams 10 minutes before. He said, it really, really worked. Um, he said, I got into there, bang, done what I needed to do, come up, took a breath. He said, my, my awareness around me, my time appreciation was so much better. This is a 16 year old now teaching me. Actually, my fear bubble actually helps you with time appreciation. So he taught me something that day. He said, my time appreciation was spot on. So I finished 10 minutes before the other people. I didn't need to revisit any bubbles. So I revisited one or two, but I was just, bang, I was in that zone. And I thought to myself, wow, talk about understanding um, his emotions, making them work for him. And that's what the fear bubble technique is all about. And what's really important about fear is taking control of it. Now, a lot of people, they say, oh, I've done a, a tandem skydive. And I'm like, that's great. You know, if you're scared of heights, that's great. That will take a couple of layers off. But the action, you have to take charge of. So when you're jumping out on something, you probably got your eyes closed. You know, you're putting your life in their hands, you're getting like a bulldog in the air. You know, you open your eyes and you're creaming on the floor and you're broken your legs. You know, like this. Um, you haven't taken control of that emotion. You've, you've allowed someone else to take control of that emotion, which is really good as well. So I'm going to talk about later on about positive people taking charge of your emotions. Super powerful outcome as well. But emotional intelligence is understanding that emotion for what it is and making it work for you. Actioning. That, um, that emotion. Because when you action it, um, which I'm going to show you some examples right now, when you action it, that's when you realise what you're capable of. So you're there, there, you're there, there, you action what needs to be done, you come out the other side, you go, I am capable, I've just done that. And when you realise what you're capable of, guess what kicks in the back end? Self-belief. The biggest gift you can give to yourself, but only you can gift it to yourself. How many people in your life say, oh, I believe in you, but if you don't believe in yourself, it's just empty words, they go over your head. But when you take charge of your emotions and you action it in a positive way, and you action it and take control of that, and you come out the other end and you realise what you're capable of, then self-belief kicks in the back end. I can do, I am capable of. And that was the key to my success in the Special Forces, is that self-belief, coming out of those bubbles, taking control of my emotions, which takes courage, trust me. That's when you know you're courageous, when you can really take charge of your emotions. And I'll break it down simply, emotional intelligence, understanding the emotion for what it is and making it work for you. If you're sad, you feel sad, understand what it is. Why am I feeling sad? Oh, because I, lo I lost a loved one. But how do I action this in a positive way? Well, I'm gonna go and talk to my friends and family. I'm gonna talk about their memory, I'm gonna talk about their legacy. I'm gonna talk about all the good times. That's you actioning that emotion. You need to action it in order to make it work for you. Because if not, guess what it does? It stays there, it works against you. And before you know it, you find yourself in a downward spiral. I've been there before, so I know what it's like. So you have to be courageous enough to action it. But then there's a fine line of being courageous and being reckless, right? <laughs> being stupid. Uh, which I'm going to show you a few examples of. But right now, what we're going to do, we're going to kick in to my favourite show and the reason why I still do SAS Australia is because I absolutely love the Aussies. <laughs> They're a different breed, the Aussies. Oh, you guys do not give a fuck, do you? <laughs> wow. The UK celebrities are... Oh, my nail. Um, it's racking up. I know it's racking up, but I do apologise. Get out of that military mindset. Um, SAS Australia, I love this show. And the reason why I love this show so much is because of the emotional side to it. The tasks are great, they're big, they're great. You know, the big tasks are great for the visuals. It's the small tasks, the water, the confined spaces, the heights. That's when I'm going to dig into your emotions. That's when I'm going to identify 
a vulnerability, not necessarily a weakness, just a vulnerability. I'm going to hopefully develop. That's what I want to do. I want to get into you, get into your headspace, get into your emotions, and, uh, and develop it for you. So I can give you some tools to go away with, so you can use them in everyday life. You know, emotional tools, psychological tools. Physical side is up to you. The physical side is a given. If you come on my course ill-prepared, physically, I'll just get rid of you. It's like that on selection. The first four weeks of selection, the actual select is the hill phase. You cover, you cover extreme weights, um, extreme distance with extreme weight on your back. You have to navigate yourself. You're under the, under the time restraint. You've got to beat the clock. If you don't, you're gone. No second chances. First four weeks. We lose on average about 70% of the course in the first four weeks. You have to be an athlete plus standard of fitness. That is a given. That's what I expect. I don't expect them to be athlete plus standard of fitness for some of them that come on there. I know they're just sacrificial lambs. <laughs> um, I do enjoy punishing them in the fire. Um, so uh, I don't expect them to be at that level, but I expect them to take it seriously because this isn't scripted. You now I'm here right now, not only doing my tour, but planning for the next SAS Australia. It takes months and months and months to structure. And what I'm ultimately looking for is what I call the trilogy. I'm looking for an all-rounder. That's what I'm looking for, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. So you've got the psychological side, the emotional side, and the physical side, like a triangle. If there's a disconnect between one, then we have a problem. And I will home in on that, whether it's physical, psychological, or emotional. Once I identify a disconnect, then I'll, I'll go in on it. Because if you can develop that side, and boom, keep that triangle solid, you, there's not much that will phase you through life. I'm not saying you achieve everything you set out to do, but there's not much that will phase you. So that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that all-rounded individual. And that's why I love doing the show. Now, I don't know if you saw the last series, but we had some... Uh, some big tasks and some small tasks. Now, fear, I talk about fear and the fear bubble. Some prime examples um, that I'm gonna show you in this video um, with a guy um, that you all know and you see him. And also from a very uh, capable young lady as well. Um, and I'm not digging these people out. I'm not I'm showing you examples of people that can take charge of their emotions and the outcome and then the people that don't and the devastating effects that it can have um, in everyday life, let alone on the battlefield. But before we do that, let's revisit my favourite show, SAS Australia. Akamenes and Mondine done well, didn't they? Let's <laughs> <laughs> just space them too. <laughs> so disappointed in those two. They were giving it all the big licks, yeah, you know, behind the scenes before the course started, so we get the intel from, from the health and safety. Sort of dig into them, like, yeah, they're really, really confident. Within 24 hours, Mon team was on the phone to his mum. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The producer done that behind my back. I walk in and then he's on the phone to his mum, and I'm like, to the producers, you taking a piss? <laughs> You've got his mum on the fucking phone. <laughs> Jesus. Thought I was back in the UK doing the UK <laughs> version. <laughs> he was all right. Um, anyway, let's not talk about those two. Um, <laughs> they cost a lot of money. <laughs> I, keep, I need to keep an open thing on. Anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, the course actually isn't designed to make people look bad. We're not here to focus on the drama. That's not what the show is all about. I've always made, made that very, very clear from the beginning. If people aren't you know, coping, if they're not really liking it, then we just get rid of them. We're not here to focus on the drama or why I'm not here. I'm here to focus on the people that want to be here, that are driven, that are ambitious, that actually put themselves to the forefront and you know, show their vulnerabilities, because I want to develop that, I want to help enhance that. So that's why I'm there, uh, to really, really push them and not focus on the people that get there and they think, right, it's not for me. That's each to their own. So I'm there to really focus on the people that want to be, be there. And within the first 24 hours, I'll make sure that they're there, that they're here. 
right? Because ultimately what I do is I run a course, I run a military course. The production company film it and the, sh and the channel make a show out of it. It's as simple as that. And the moment the production company thinks that they can run the course or script the course, then I'm out of there. And again, you know, that's happened before and I won't allow it to happen again in Australia. That's why I love the Aussies because the James Orbiton, the CEO of Channel 7, is like, no, fucking mate, give them hell. Just give them hell. Make them suffer. The Aussies love it. <laughs> so I'm like, sick fuckers, we love it. <laughs> um, but what I do love is just seeing them change in front of my eyes. That I do really, really enjoy that mess. When the penny drops, because it's so tense, it's so stressful, and then the pressure's always on. The moment of clarity when I see that they complete something that they're petrified of, Bang, you see a switch turn within themselves. Again, that I am capable, self-belief kicks in the back end. When I say, that is visible to see in someone's eye. And when they're placed in front of a fearful situation where they have to control their emotions, that's how they come to that self-belief. An emotion has presented itself. Why is it, I'm scared, why am I scared? Because I'm scared of heights, right? What do I need to do now? Get over that ledge and take control of going down. Once you've done that, bang, huge capability, self belief kicks in the back end. However, if you get it wrong, it can be absolutely catastrophic. I'm going to show you a clip, and I want you to listen very carefully to what Peter Bowles says. Um, the guy's scared of um, confined spaces and water. So I really try to sort of make him see what he was doing, really calm him down so we could get this task done. But for those of you that saw it, Fucking nightmare, an absolute nightmare. And I'm going to show you it right now, and I want you to really listen to what he says because ultimately his emotions didn't work for him here. And this is a prime example of how wrong it can go. <laughs> when I watched that back, it wasn't as bad as that when I was doing it. But now I watch that back, he's got his snot everywhere, and he's vomit everywhere. He was drowning, basically drowning in a little pipe. Good job I cut a little hole in there, what the hell? I wasn't going to do that. I'm just going to do a bit dead right now. <laughs> so, um, Peter, great guy, an intelligent guy, really intelligent guy. But emotional intelligence is completely different to what's up here. Again, understanding that emotion for what it is and making it work for you. Again, action it is great, it's courageous, but then you can be reckless. And this is what happens when you're reckless. When actually you just dive in head first, literally, into something. That is actually you not taking control of your emotions. That's like you going up on a bungee jump and just jumping off. That actually you've got to take control of it in order to make that emotion work for you. Because that's when you come out the other side. Wow, I've done it by myself. I've taken charge of my emotions. Self-belief kicks in the back end. That was the equivalent of him getting up there and bungee jumping off and just taking the responsibility away from him. He's just like, right, I think we've got to do this. He's like, fit, scared of water, scared of confined spaces. Bang, you either go, she's dumped, jumped in head first. Wow. And then that as a result, it can be absolutely catastrophic. I've seen people do that um, on the battlefield. Just, just bang, gone. So this is the prime example of really taking charge of it. It's probably better to turn around and go that way than it is to commit to it sometimes. But you've got to be in that situation. You can see when I told him, I told him to listen to me. Bang, completely, like he said, his mind shut off. Because that emotion presented itself from scared of water and he just couldn't think. Even I was like that, listen to me. As I said, listen to me, he dived in head first. Bang, straight in there. And I had to drag him out. So that's a prime example of his emotions working against him. And remember what I said, it's very simple. Don't try and complicate things. It's like, things either work for you or they don't. Your mindset's gonna work for you, it's not. Your emotions are gonna work for you or they're not. Prime example of your emotions not working for you. And when it's on that side of the spectrum, it can be devastating and it can cost lives. So you've really, really got to take charge of it. Now the next person I'm gonna show you was Abby. Who remembers Abby? Abby Holmes. Yes. She was great. Um, and she was absolutely petrified of heights. 
And the reason why I laugh is because we've done the biggest abseil in SAS history from a tower. So you can imagine, Abby was down there, she was shaking. You don't see a lot that goes on behind the scenes, but she was shaking, crying. I went up to her and I explained the fear bubble to her. I said to her, look, listen, I do this a lot. Explain the fear bubble, why are you crying here? She said, because I'm scared. I said, well, what, what, why, why are you scared? So you're not even in that situation. So you're not even looking over the edge. I said, it's your mind here. It's not the emotion that presents itself. It's your mind now playing tricks on you. Right, what if I can't do it? What if I fall? What if I can't hold myself? What if my, my equipment fails? What if I don't make it down? Again, your mind playing tricks on you before the emotion is, all, is even presented itself. I said, chill, relax. Nothing's going to happen to you while you're sat on the floor crying. So you're draining yourself physically, psychologically, and emotionally, and you probably won't even commit to these steps to get up to the tower. I said, just break it down. I said, when you're over that edge, and you're, I said, you're in the bubble then. I said, and then what you have to do, you, you commit to it. I said, take charge of your action. Now, the abseil is absolutely great for emotional intelligence. It is the best exercise if you want to conquer your fear of heights, or if you want to at least take layers off of it. Because guess what you've got to do? You've got to get up there, You've got to strap yourself on, and this is why I talk about taking control, taking charge, and then you've got to abseil down yourself. That action, that action phase, you've got to control it. And then when you get down and you hit the ground, guess what? You've done it yourself. I am capable of, I can do. Self-belief kicks in the back end. That's the difference when I talk about taking charge of that emotion, controlling that emotion, and then not controlling it. Like I said, with a bungee jump, for example, or a tandem skydive. Don't get me wrong, great things to do to take layers off to get used to the heights, but you must take charge of that emotion for it to work for you, for you to realise what you're capable of, and then for self-belief to kick in the back end. You repeat that process time and time again, that's all I do. And then boom, away you go. Now I'm going to show you Abby here again, like I said, petrified, paralysed, I would say, even paralysed, to the point where I was like, I'm going to lose her. Um, she won't even get up. But she managed to get up and have a quick look at someone who takes charge of her. This woman, petrified. I'm talking petrified. Yeah. When I see that, I see that happen, that makes the course worth its while for me. That's the reward that I get when I see that happening because she was absolutely paralysed. And she did use the fear bubble method. Because she, she told me after, she went, yeah, I got up there and I didn't, didn't have time to let that emotion completely engulf me like I did for six months when I was in Afghanistan or even for a few minutes. Bang, once she committed, guess what? She's committed. She has to take charge of her actions. If not, she's going, she's going right to the bottom. She's missing that window and um, going straight to the floor. It took her about 25 seconds, 22 I think it was, to get down. So she was in that bubble for probably 22 seconds. That's why I say seconds, minutes. Then, boom, as soon as she hits the deck, guess what? She's out of that bubble. Now she's in a clear room, she's good to go. That's the fear bubble method. Again, we have to do that time and time and time and time and time again. But burst one bubble at a time. And then once you repeat that process, you'll learn how to burst them concurrently, consecutively. Okay, and this is what I expected from um, Abby on the next one. She just burst that bubble, and maybe I expected a bit too much from her. This is her next uh, <laughs> task. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you, Abby. I was so proud of her until that moment. <laughs> until she killed the hostage. But listen, it's uh, all in layers, right? So, you know, I was super proud that she managed to burst that first bubble. But it is literally as quick as that. Bang, you're in there, I'm in that bubble, room clear. Right, to the next door, I'm in, up against the next door, in that bubble, room clear. It's those moments of clarity in between that you really um, take charge of. And then the emotion, just that would just pop through, pop through, pop through, pop through. And uh, you can see there, it was a big task, a big task to do that and then to go into a hostage rescue. Um, and as you can see, she was still, just elated because she was, her feet were on the ground, she was alive. You know, that adrenaline sometimes too much, she was rattled, so then you, we gave her a weapon. And I love, I love the sound effects of that view, it's the pain that we've done. Boom, 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 boom. Oh, what the fuck have you done? You've made it all Hollywood. Um, I just remember it going tick, 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 tick. Um, And then she bittled everyone up. She, uh, she shot everyone. 
And um, now she has to, unfortunately, not live with that. But that's how serious it is on the battlefield. You know, we're after the bad guys, that's it, you know. Um, and when, again, the devastating effect of not harnessing your emotions or not taking charge of your emotions, that's what happens as well. So it can have huge detrimental effects on not only yourself, but on others. So that's why it's super important to take charge of your emotions. And I know this first half has been a seminar on emotional intelligence, but I really want you to understand that through emotional intelligence, it's through exposing that emotion, understanding what it is and making it work for you, i.e. taking control of it and actioning it until you're out of that situation that will change you as an individual. A lot of people, they feel fear and they go, boom, bang, and never expose it. We have an armory full of emotions, full of emotions. When one presents itself, fucking take, boom, try and understand what it is and what's triggered it. Again, I'm not going on like, like a fucking psychiatrist, I'm not, um, <laughs> psychologist, sorry, I'm a psychologist. But it's really, really important because once I broke that down simply, I thought, right, to be honest with myself, why did, why did that happen? Because I was scared, well, I was scared because there's bullets coming out the door. Right, happy days. Also, before I leave you to go on the interval, um, emotional intelligence is uh, something that we keep to ourselves most of the time because we experience something negative with it, with our emotions, whether that's someone that's, that's taken advantage of our emotions or through a traumatic experience and we, we case ourselves away. Therefore, you are casing yourself away. You will never realise what you're capable of. You'll never go through that process of becoming a better version of yourself or understanding yourself because you've chosen to look it up. However, when you let positive people take charge of your emotions, it will change your life. But because we experience it once from negative people taking charge of our emotions and absolutely rinsing them and annihilating them, we lock it all up. But trust me, when a positive person comes along and takes charge of your emotions for you, they will take you to the next level. So always keep them open, keep your circle safe, keep your circle small, and make sure that you trust people with your emotions. And that's what's so important about SAS Australia and why I still do it, and why I won't let the production try and run the course or try and script it. Because you cannot take charge of someone's emotions and use it for a narrative. Or it can never be misplaced or misjudged. You, can, you can't, I'm not saying I always get it right, but I'm there with them every single time to make sure I can tweak it because emotions are such an important part of your being. And if you, if you get it wrong, it can have devastating effects, as you see. But what we're going to do now, before you go on your interval, the next half is going to be exclusive K2, my climb of uh, K2, the Widowmaker, as they call it. Um, the Savage Mountain is known as the hardest mountain to climb in the world, and I can back that up. It is indeed the hardest mountain to climb. Enjoy the VT, enjoy the break, and I will see you after. Thank you. Um, now, moving swiftly on, just something to think about there. Um, K2. Now, the footage I'm about to show you, I've had to have signed off especially. You will not find any of this on the internet. You won't find any of it anywhere. Some of this footage is some of the first footage that I've seen back, actually, as well. Um, so I've had it signed off by my production company that I've filmed this with. Um, for you guys. So you are going to get the first download on what went on in Pakistan, um, climbing the second highest mountain in the world, but the most dangerous, K2. Um, K2 sits at 8,611 meters. Um, K2, K2, K2. Now, I'm going to tell you the story about K2, how it came about. Um, I was at home by myself, sitting on the couch, and I got a phone call from a good power mine called Nims. I don't know if you've seen his documentary, it's called 14 Peaks. I've known Nims for 15 years, I was in the Special Forces with Nims. And um, I sat down, and my phone rang, and I looked at it, and it was Nims with his little fat head coming up on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> that was one. So I answered the phone, I like, Andy, what are you doing? I'm like, sitting on the couch. He's like, what are you doing for the next couple of weeks? I said, well, actually, I said, I've got a, I'm working for the next two and a half weeks. I said, after that, I've got a four-week gap. He's like, a four-week gap? He said, 
I said, yeah, in two weeks we're perfect. He said, do you want to climb K2? And I was like, yeah. I called his bluff, I called his bluff, right? Well, I thought I called his bluff, but he called my bluff. <laughs> um, so I said to him, yeah, I do want to climb K2, let's do it. So he said, right, do me a favour right now. He said, send me your passport and um, I will get you the permit straight away. I was like, yeah, of course you will. But uh, yeah, no worries, mate. Yeah, speak to you later, whatever names. Yeah, goodbye. Boom, sent my passport. At six hours later, tee tee! Fucking permit. Fucking crazy. I was like, like, yeah, bro, really looking forward to you coming out. And by this stage, my wife was still out. So you can imagine, you know, she comes in, she's like, I'm sat on the couch like that, just sweating. And it's done. Um, she's like, how's your day, darling? I'm like, yeah, um, good. She's like, what have you been doing? I was like, oh, I spoke to Mims. Oh, how is he? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, he's good. I said, uh, he's climbing K2 in a couple of weeks. And she stopped. <laughs> you know, like, you know, yeah, he's climbing. And you're fucking climbing that women, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about the fear bubble. It was like, <laughs> 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 I'm like, oh, darling, please don't kill me. Um, I was like, yes, I am. She knew straight away. Um, I said to her, yes, I am. So I'm climbing K2. She went, oh, just, yeah. One, I thought you said you're never going to climb again after Everest. Um, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but this one's not as dangerous. Um, <laughs> so straight away, just on Google. Google. Um, it's called the Widowmaker. <laughs> Obviously, look at K2, it's called the Widowmaker. So I was just like, is it? <laughs> Didn't know that. I just thought it was the second highest mountain in the world. She's like, it's called the Savage Mountain. Man. You know that, don't you? I was like, yeah, I said, darling, listen, you know, you know I like to do things in trees, I want to climb the highest mountain, the, the three highest mountains in the world. So this one happens to be the second highest of Woody climbed Everest. She went, bullshit. I went, yeah, it is. I said, I just want to climb it because it's the most dangerous mountain in the world. So um, that's what really enticed me to the mountain. It was, again, not so much the danger of it, but it was the mystique of it. A bit like the special forces, you know, what's behind that cloak? K2, it's, it's, I think before I climbed it, it was like 20% uh, fatality rate. It's um, known to be such a savage mountain, and even to this day, some seasons you can't even climb it because the weather's too bad. There's no weather window whatsoever. So I was taking a huge gamble anyway. So um, I thought to myself, do you know what? Getting there, I've got four weeks to do it. It's going to be tough because I've got literally four weeks from the day I'd land to being back home, to being back at work. Um, I've got four weeks to do it. I just managed to get the sign off from the wife. Didn't really have much of a choice, but um, she was like, yeah, just go and do what you've got to do. It's fine, just go, go and do it. Um, and again, the reason why I do it is because I just like to keep writing my story. I like to keep pushing myself. That process that I talk about I practice it all the time. You know, I'm always finding myself in uncomfortable positions. There's no growth in comfort. Like when I get too comfortable, I'm not growing. I always go back to that. And there's no growth in comfort. There's no growth in comfort. I thought, why? Right, this is time to get outside of my comfort zone yet again, learn about myself, grow, become the better version of myself. Even if it's a couple of percent, just, just keep that process going. So that's exactly what I did. Within two weeks of that phone call, I was on a plane to Islamabad, to Pakistan. Me, fucking Pakistan. Um, visited it a few times, unofficially. <laughs> but never officially. Um, this was the first. <laughs> so um, I remember jumping on the flight, and I remember someone saying to me, Ann, this isn't the Himalayas. And I was like, what do you mean this is in the Himalayas? The Himalayas, everything's there, so this is the Pakistan mountains. It's the weather, they've got, it's got its own weather conditions. It is horrendous. And I'm like, listen, I know what I have to choose like. I know what, you know what I need to do. I know how I need to cover up because I've been there and I've done it before. And he's like, no, I'm just warning you. That it has its own weather pattern. The Himalayas, everything out there welcomes you to the mountains. In the Pakistan mountains, everything wants to kill you. That's exactly what he said to me. like, that. <clears throat> again. Um, no. So anyway, I flew, to, um, I flew to Pakistan and I flew to Skardu, I've got an internal flight to Skardu. Now this is where the, um, the base camp trek starts. Now what's different about this is you can drive up to a certain amount um, to base camp and then 
you're on foot. But the whole mountain range in the Pakistan mountains where K2 is, is controlled by the military. So there's none of this commercial stuff that you see going on, where the helicopters come in with all the kit, you know, you literally got everything, you got to carry everything. There's no, water, there's no helicopters in and out of base camp. So it's a case of you need to do that trek in and out by yourself. And again, only in dire emergencies, and um, there was an emergency on the mountain, that will the, will the helicopters come in reluctantly. And I'm talking of four or five days of negotiating. So I knew the moment that I was in Skardu, um, the base camp trek started, and it started off by vehicle. See, I've got the Garmin sponsor in there. <laughs> Look at that, yeah. Um, Skardu, I, I remember getting off the plane in Skardu and just, just feeling um, a sense of, well, wow, I am by myself. I went onto this runway, this little small tiny airport, right through it, it felt like, it didn't feel like the Himalayas, so straight away I was like, right, okay, this, uh, my power who said to me, just be aware that it's not the Himalayas, started to kick in then. And now, so we set off on the, uh, on the base camp trek. Now, it is meant to be the toughest of the base camp treks. Um, they're all pretty tough anyway. The Everest base camp trek is tough. You know, you're sitting at 5,000, 5,200 meters there, so you've got some serious altitude. But this one, I was told, it is rough underfoot. You literally have to find your way through. Sometimes the paths are gone, because if the sun is out, which you think is a good thing, it's a bad thing because you're exposed to the sun all the time, you've seen me a couple of times with an umbrella. Um, and also, um, it melts the glacier water. So it comes off the mountains and it just destroys what's ever in front of it. And fortunately, on this base camp trek, three people lost their lives just on the trek. Because you have to cross certain parts where there's no, the path is no longer and you have to get across the glacier because you don't know where these sort of streams or these glaciers uh, uh, water is going to take you. So it's a case of figuring it out on the hoof, which I found really, really interesting as well. And uh, again, another pointer of right, I'm out there by myself. And it being one of the toughest um, base camp treks out there. So take a look at this. This is me um, tackling some of that terrain. <laughs> that water was so cold. You hit it and you, I felt like I was on my knees. Couldn't feel my bottom of my legs. But um, we needed to get through it to, uh, to get to uh, base camp. And it was like that the whole time. We would just really just sort of navigate, pick a reference point to where the mountain was and sort of belay for it. And every time we went over a little bridge or something, we came down, wow. especially with that, we're like, we've got to cross it. And obviously boots off, socks off, because the moment you go back into the air, your boots would just freeze. So as a case of you just had to adapt on the ground. And again, if you don't know what you're doing, that will take you away. The moment you hit that water, that glacier water, which is freezing cold, and it takes you down. Good luck trying to get back up. That wasn't too deep, it's here. And sometimes you, people go into it, they think it's shallow, bang, never, never to be seen again. Boom, you go under that, you're in a whole world of pain. Um, and this is the route that we took to K2 Base Camp. So as you can see from Skardu, that's where I got off the plane. Um, we've got a uh, vehicle to a scoli, lots of bridges, beautiful. You start to take in the surrounding areas. Um, then to Jola. Jola is where you get dropped off. There's no more vehicle access from Jola. To Jola, we spent the night at Jola, first thing in the morning, first light, up, out. And we pegged it all the way to Peyu. You can see there's multiple camps along the way. This normally takes this trek, if you're doing just the trek, Trekkers do it in about 10 days. They take their time, they, 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 they do it because they're just doing that. But because the trek wasn't part of my climb, I just needed to get to base, um, to base camp. And um, we pegged it, so we bypassed a couple of camps. I think we were like going for about 12 hours. Got to Pe Peyu, spent the night there, went to Udakris. Now, when you go to these camps, Udakris was quite, it's sort of like in the middle. It's quite near base camp. So it's quite a big camp. And when we got there, there was a lot of, a lot of illness going around. There. You hear a lot of people coughing and spluttering. Um, so you try and sort of steer clear because you know that you haven't just got the trek, you've got the climb, you know, a couple of weeks of climbing thereafter. So you try and preserve yourself the best as possible. So we stayed there and then the next one we went to, normally you meant to go to Gould 2, then Concordia. 
but we decided to go in between the two. We made an isolated camp there. So we were just by ourselves. It was myself, David Migma, that you saw there, who is uh, one of the best young Sherpas in the world, um, with me, a good friend of mine. And we just decided just to go off the beaten path, set up our tents, sleep, and then peg it to K2 base camp. So from the drop off, we we done it in, uh, we spent three nights, we done it, we got there on the fourth day. And um, that was a bit quick, because I remember getting to, uh, to base camp and thinking, wow, we've absolutely smashed this. And then the headaches start to kick in, you, know, you start to feel a bit sick, and you know that you've not acclimatized correctly. But time wasn't on my side. I wanted to get in there, get up. I needed to be from the day I landed to the day I flew back, it needed to be four weeks. So you know, I thought to myself, just, let's just go there and get it done and get it smashed down. Um, when we arrived at K2 Base Camp, it was quite nice because I was expecting, I'm a bit like Everest, when I went to Everest Base Camp in 2018 before I, I summited, um, we were staying in tents, so um, just small tents. So I was thinking well, when I got there that NIMS, because NIMS was uh, running the expedition, but I just had a Sherpa with me. I just climbed with myself and Sherpa, and on the summit rotations and the other rotations, I had two Sherpas with me. That's all I wanted was a small team of Sherpas and myself. Um, so when we got to K2 base camp, I was uh, in for quite a surprise. Check this out. And when I got to K2 base camp, what I didn't realize was the toll that it was already taking on my body. Because I'd done it in three and a half days, it was from Jola to K2 base camp, 90 kilometers. And because we covered that in three days, and then we got to an altitude of 5,000 meters, or just above 5,000 meters, um, I didn't realize at the time, feel the slight headaches and I could feel the slight nausea coming on but again I'm just thinking to myself right I need to just try and recover as quick as I can because in two three days I've got to go for my first rotation up the mountain in, in order to complete that first rotation come back down and then hit a summit rotation at the end of the month and then be back down and then straight out again to get my plane home because I have work commitments um, contractual work commitments. So in my head, it's just like, right, just, just ignore what's going on, which is not always the best thing to do. Um, but I know my body. I know my body. I feel my body. I know when I'm pushing it beyond its limits. And I like it when that happens because I know that we've got that threshold and we can always go beyond. It's just, again, it's a mental block with yourself, not pushing yourself beyond those limits. So I knew I was pushing myself beyond my limits, but I've been there before. So again, it's just that repetition. I've been here before, I know what to expect, I know why I'm feeling this pain, I know why I'm doing it, so I'm just gonna keep pushing, pushing, pushing until I don't recognize that, that type of pain, until I don't recognize that, then I know I'm at a new boundary, in, whether it's physically, psychologically, or emotionally. So when you're in a new space, remember, you know, commit to a new space, right? you, you, it's the first time that you're there, you're gonna learn about it, you're gonna grow from it, and you're gonna start to understand it. So I've been there before, I was like, no, no I'm okay. And, um, but what I didn't realize again, because we've done it so fast, that I was losing some serious weight. And you'll see as the uh, VTs go on, you'll see how quickly uh, I sort of uh, degrade and become decrepit. Um, so two days go past, and then I'm like, right, I need to do the first rotation. And he was like, it's a bit early. Um, I said, no, and I said, I need to get up there. He said, okay, then listen, take one Sherpa, um, take one Sherpa go and do your first rotation. The weather's not gonna to be too good, he said, but there's a window. So I'm thinking, right, in my head, again, this is where the Himalayas and the Pakistan mountains are completely separate. Um, I thought to myself, I've done the lower camps before. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do like I've done on Everest. I'm gonna go up to, get up to camp three, so I'm gonna to go to camp one, spend the night, go to camp two, spend the night, go to camp three, touch camp three, spend a couple of hours, come back down, and do, just do that big rotation in one. Again, ill-advised, but if, you're, if, you, if you acclimatize correctly, but I didn't have the time on my side, I've done it before. So again, you know, there's, there's risk assessments that you do personally, and I thought, I can do that. So um, off I went, and um, I can just remember hitting the crampon point before I went up to camp one. And I'm going up to camp one, and I'm just in normal kit. Right, because I think I don't need my summit suit, I don't need any of my big kit, any of my big mitts, any of them. I'm going to go quite light. I don't need oxygen at this stage, I'm only going to camp three. 
Um, so I can do this quite clean fatigue, quite light. Um, I take, you know, I obviously take food, water, some te tents, etc., etc. But um, I don't need to carry all the bulk kit up right, um, right yet. You know, I can, I can do that just on my summit rotation. So I leave, get to camp one, and the weather's starting to come in. I get my head down, wake up first thing in the morning. Headaches, blue. my head is boom, boom. It feels like the tent is just, it is moving. So I think to myself, right, I just need to just keep going and then just, you know, keep, keep an eye on myself, basically. So from camp, so I spend the night at camp one, spend, um, go from camp one on the way to camp two. Now, as we leave camp one, um, the Sherpa says, I think we should stay and spend another night. I was thinking, I'm for that, because my head is booming. Feels like my head's gonna explode, and um, I could do with an extra night here. And then I get a call through the radio saying, "No, no, no, push through because if you don't, there's a weather window coming in, and you'll get stuck up there. So push up there now, get up there, and, and get the job done." So again, made a decision myself and my sherpa. It's just me and the sherpa on the mountain at this stage. No one else is there. I'm not part of a big expedition, even though I'm coming under Nim's umbrella. I've got my own little tent and I'm doing my own little thing with, with my Sherpas. Um, so this is me kind of going from camp one to camp two and realizing and almost having flashbacks on what the hell am I doing? That Everest flashback of, wow, this has come back around. Now at this point, it's minus 29 with the wind chill. I've got normal bog standard fucking mid layer on. I've got a uh, I've got a, um, a sort of like an underarm on, shall we say. So I've got a, a base layer, I've got a mid layer, a fleece, and then I've got just a, a, a down jacket, not a big one, but just a, just a light one. And that's how you see me with my hood up. I've got hiking trousers, like normal hiking trousers on, um, and my socks and my boots. I'm wearing a half shank boot at this stage. So I've got half shank boots, but I've got my crampons on, obviously. So, I would say I'm ill prepared for that weather. Because when that came in, I got my hands and you can see the, the video start to really distort. And my hands, I, I went to, the, the reason why I took it off, I couldn't open my hand because it was frozen sharp. So I had silly little gloves on as well. Um, and as you saw, there's a little rocky outcrop at the top. Um, my chuck turned around to me and said, Dan, just, just get up to the, to the rocky outcrop. We got up to the Rocky Out, but at this stage I'm having huge flashbacks, right? So I'm going, right, fucking hell, this is Everest 202. What are you doing, then? So I get into the Rocky Outcrop, and I say to the Sherpa, this time I'm like, we need to turn around. I said, I'm, you know, I haven't got my key. He said, Anne, he said, it's quicker to go up to Camp 2 now than it is to turn around to go to Camp 1. He said, we've got about four hours to go to Camp 2. He said, and you've probably got about five hours because it's so steep. That's why it's so dangerous, K2, because it's so steep. Because it's so steep, it's actually easier to go up and quicker to go up than it is to go down, especially if you're trying to repel down. It's just with that visibility and that wind, it would have been a complete nightmare. And obviously having tension on the rope with two of us, it just wouldn't have happened. So for the first time, I'm like, let's turn it back around. Let's go back down to camp one. He's like, listen, Five hours or four hours. At this stage, I've taken my gloves off, because I've only got gloves, I haven't got mitts with me, I didn't bring any of my bulky kit with me. And my, I call it my summit kit. So I put my hands, so I hide behind this outcrop, I take my gloves off and I, and I put my hands underneath my armpits. And I, and I have to stay there for about a good six, seven minutes for my fingers to warm up, I cannot feel them. And at this stage, I'm starting to think, right, I'm, I'm screwed. I'm really, really screwed here because I can either sit in here now, and, but we just have to keep moving. And I can remember just thinking to myself, I can feel my fingers now, putting my gloves back on. The camera didn't come out, you can trust me, that was, that was well away. Um, I, didn't, I didn't film any of that. And then we just, just staunched up to camp two, but I was stopping, no word of a lie, because I would say that I was ill prepared, so no fault of my own. I was stopping every 20 minutes or, 15 minutes because my hands were just gone. So every 20 minutes I was just shielding myself, trying to get in a little outcrop into a little rocky area because you can't rest. And that's why it's so draining, so dangerous. 
is because people make mistakes on that mountain because it's just, just relentless. And then psh, once you start, there's no getting your footing back. You can see people, you know, they're climbing like that and it's literally steep like this. So hence why it's so dangerous and why so many people don't come off that mountain is because psh, they're gone. And also the rock fall, the rock fall as well, that comes down psh, 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 and it whizzes past you like bullets and missiles. Fortunately for us, there was no one above us on the mountain, so we didn't have to deal with rockfall on our, on our first rotation, but the second rotation we did. So we get to camp two in this storm, and we're stuck there for three days. And this is me, this next clip is me on day two, stuck in the tent in this storm, trying to keep my tent a tent, and thinking to myself, what the heck? hell have I done? So that stage, you can imagine my mind is now starting to play tricks on me, because I know it. I'm not scared, my emotions aren't coming to the forefront, because I'm in a tent, I'm actually, you know, sheltered, but my mind is starting to play tricks on me. Again, taking charge of my mind, it's like, right, not triggering that emotion from when I was back on Everest, or from the day before, the two days before, when we were climbing up here, realising how bad it was. Just taking charge of my mind, knowing that my mind plays tricks on me. Again, if your mind doesn't work for you, guess what? It doesn't work against you. And I was trying my hardest to try and express how I was feeling. And when I do that, because I'm a very visual person, when I do that through my emotions or when I do it through something that symbolizes that I can really look at and really try and understand, it helps me. That's me. It really does help me. So when I spoke about that poll, it was like, oh, fucking hell, that's a replica of my mind right now. That's a mirror of my mind. I don't know whether I'm coming or going. I want to go up or down. What the fuck am I doing? This fucking bowl doesn't know what the fuck it's doing either. And you can see my Sherpa. He's just on down there because he's looked outside. And the tent is just going boom, 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 boom. And straight after I turned the camera off, probably about two minutes, I turned the camera off. He's got his bowl of coffee. I've got my bowl of whatever the fuck that was. I don't know what it was. And I took a sip and... Um, I, he said to, I said to him, what are we going to do? I said, we, we, we're going to have to move. He said, we can't stay here. It's been, you know, two days, it's the third day we're in that tent. Um, I said, we have to move. And as I said that, in, and my Sherpa said, well, we're going to have to wait for a window. Just any window that presents itself, you just get up and fucking go. And this is no word of a lie. As he says that, we sip our coffee, he sips his coffee and the tent goes silent. First time it's gone silent for, it's like a deafening silence. First time it's gone silent for three days, not like, mum, 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 mum. Just look at each other. We're like, oh, I'm fucking doing nothing. I'm fucking going at my face. I'm like, yeah, let's fucking go. I'm like, fucking get my shoes on. We get out. So like, obviously, that was our window, that was our, that was our cue to go. And by the time we got out, it took us a, you know, a few minutes to pack up and maybe about. 15, 16 minutes, but that was the cue to go. And even when we got outside, the weather hadn't changed. But psychologically, we had that advantage because it was like, boom, that was the window. That was almost like a calling, or it's almost like it was meant to be. <laughs> now you get signs in life. I'm, I'm taking that sign, bang, I'm gonna use it to my advantage. It really helped me psychologically because we were just both freaked out and looked at each other so to say, there you go, we just literally said that and the tent has gone silent. So what we done, we got, we got dressed, um, and it was a um, horrendous, horrendous experience getting that down. Don't forget we are at Camp 2, I wanted to go to Camp 3, but impossible. Um, remember, sometimes that mountain doesn't allow you to even go up it. Sometimes you cannot access the mountain um, some years because the weather's so bad. So once we got that window, we, kept, we, we uh, decided that we'd make our way back down. Now, when I got back down to base camp, I was like that, that's it. I said, I'm not, I'm not doing this ever, I'm not doing it, I'm going home. Honest to God, I got back down and thought, nah. I said, my family have allowed me to be here. Um, you know, I'm not, why am I doing this? I'm doing this just for, my, for myself. It's way too reckless. Um, <coughs> again, flashbacks from Everest, just lucky to be back down. I wanted, by the time I got back down, from that, my feet were so cold, there's no way that I wanted to hack them off with my ice axe. I was thinking to myself, my feet were so, I just couldn't feel, that, feel anything to the point where I thought, honestly, things that are going through my head at the time. So I get back, and then um, I dipped all my kit, I start packing my kit. 
I take my boots off, I'm gone. And I say to myself, I'm gone. And then I sit down, I take all my clothes off, I'm going to have a little wash on my wipes, my baby wipes, because I, um, I can't go out because it's horrendous out there. Um, all the water's frozen, you can't have the, the showers that you want. And I sat there and I looked at my legs. And uh, I'm going to show you a picture right now of my legs. Now this isn't because of the heat. My legs aren't burnt here. This is the wind chill of me being a fucking idiot and going up in my hiking trousers, in my trekking trousers. The, 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 it was that cold that penetrated all of my layers of my clothes and I got wind, um, wind burn on my leg. You can see this, it's starting to blister, starting to scab up. And I looked at that and I thought, right, that's it, go home. From that moment onwards, um, literally a couple of minutes after that, um, I took that picture, sort of laid on my thing and I fell asleep. And I fell asleep until the morning, the next morning. And when I woke up the next morning, um, I woke up just with a, in a, in a different mindset. I rested my emotions, I rested my head, I rested my body, and I was in a completely different space. So sometimes taking that beat, taking that moment to really take the situation in, to not let your emotions take charge, to not let your mindset play tricks on you. Because if I didn't have taken that picture probably and not fallen asleep, then I probably would have gone like, right, let's go, I would have probably just gone, bang, day sack on, ditched up all my kit, given it to the shirts, whatever. But for the first time ever on a mission or on a task, I wanted to go home and thought enough is enough, I'm gone. And it wasn't until I fell asleep and woke up that the day was a fresh day. And that's true to life. And when you're having a bad moment, do not let it trickle into a bad day. It's just bad moments. Okay, you have to have a multiple bad moments for you to have a bad day. And that is extremely unlucky. And I had, unfortunately, had a multiple bad moments for that day. But when I woke up, I realized it was a fresh day, it was a new day. A new day to think, a new day to tackle, a new day in front of me. And I almost felt really, really grateful. I woke up and I just had a word for myself. Again, just being completely honest with myself. I thought to myself, right, why are you doing this? I'm doing this so I can pass on the best version of myself to my kids, to my family, to my loved ones. They've given me this time. This is what I said to myself. My wife and my children have allowed me to take this month, this four weeks, and go and do what I need to do. Because they know the benefits of me coming home and, and, and giving that out and dishing that out. You know? positive, being there, energetic, being there, you know, you know, giving them everything that I can internally. And I woke up and I thought to myself, right, I'm going to use my family for the first time ever. I said, I'm going to use my family to get through this climb. When I tackle this, rot this rotation now, this summer rotation, I'm going to pretend that all of my kids are by my side. So I'm going to go from base camp to camp one. I'm going to use my youngest son, Bly. I'm going to pretend he's by my side. Camp two to camp three, Triseus. I'm going to pretend she's by my side, my, my eight-year-old daughter. From camp two to camp three, I'm going to use uh, Gabriel. And then and I thought, you know, I said I'm going to use each of my children now. And it's the first time I've ever done this. So I am now stepping into a completely different emotional realm here. Because normally when I go into combat, it's like, keep that emotion, I just use the emotion I need to get through that moment. You know, use my fear, use whatever I need to do to get through that, that moment to keep myself alive. I didn't want the distractions of using my family. But here, it was different because when I woke up, the first one that came to my mind was my wife and my kids. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to take them on this journey. They've allowed me to be here. They've sacrificed their time away from their dad. I've sacrificed them. I'm going to do them proud. I'm going to do this. And that's exactly what I've done. I went on the, um, on the rotations, first rotation, and it was horrible. I didn't enjoy any of this climb, by the way. Just to let you know that. First climb, Bly by my side. Every time I was struggling, because I'd done it, I was doing it so quick as well that my emotions were everywhere. I knew they were. I acknowledged that they were. Because I was thinking, right, I'm really smashing this out of the ballpark. I've got to really just, just get up there and get it done. So, Bly by my side, say it's by my side, and I thought, every time it was hard, I can just remember looking down and pretending that my son needed me. That I, he, he, the pain and the suffering that I was going through was nothing because I needed to drag my son up to camp one and get him up to camp one. Camp one to camp two, for say it's my daughter, and this is a little, uh, a little uh, video of me using my family for the very first time 
to get a task done, to get a mission done, whatever it may be. My mission was to touch the summit, get back down and get back down to my family. As you can see how steep that was, it's not like Everest where it's dug in because there's so few people on the mountain. You're literally trailblazing. And uh, that was a sunny day. And again, probably minus 22, 23 because of the wind chill. The weather, the, the wind was just relentless. And then you get the storms that came in from my first rotation. Luck I, I had a feeling that was going to come again, but luckily it didn't. Luckily, after this moment, once I've got to camp two, you can see there, I call her PP, my daughter, Prisaeus. I'm like, we're nearly there, darling. In my head, it's just like, right, I've got to get her to, to camp two. And that's what I've done for the duration of my, uh, my summit rotation. I just used my family. Each leg, I used one of my children. So from three to four, it was uh, Gabriel. And then from four to, to the summit, it was Shyla. Then I used my wife to get back down. Um, and it's the first time, like I said, that I used those emotions, those family emotions, to get the job done. I tell you what, it worked. But Koch, was it an emotional roller coaster? I've never been so not in charge of my emotions ever than this trip. But also with the altitude um, and the quickness that I've done it in, it plays with your emotions, it plays with your head. The whole thing is, is, is quite dangerous if you don't get it right. Again, time wasn't on my side, but it really, really helped me to focus and I used the emotions of my family. And again, the first time I've ever done that. And I always, always said to people before, don't use your family, you know. It's, but again, just putting myself in those situations, I understand why now people look at their family, that's really what pushes them on, their kids, their loved ones, whatever it may be, really pushes them on to, to achieve incredible things. And this was the prime example of using my family's um, emotions to really get to the, to the summit of, of K2. Um, and again, just that mindset shift as well. It's a new day. It's a new day. This too shall pass. Remember that. So this was us now on our summit rotation, getting past, and it was almost the reverse effect of Everest, where the first rotation was nice and sunny, and then the summit rotation was horrendous. This was like the opposite. First rotation was horrendous. The start of the second, the summit rotation was horrendous. And then it got into this. That's me stood on the summit with David Vigma. Um, see the picture, but in my right hand I've got, it's called Le Petit Roi. I've got a little king. It's a teddy bear that my mum bought my, uh, my son. And um, I used that to, you know, that was the thing that got me up there. Um, and when I summited on this day, um, I took that out because that was at the forefront of my mind. Any other day I would have forgotten about it. You know, I would have been stuffed in my bag, I would have gone. But because they were the reason that I got to the top of K2, um, it was just there. All the emotions were there. I got the right kit on this time, so um, I didn't fuck up there. Um, and that was a day that I remember just thinking, wow, the growth that I had, the emotional growth that I had, even though you could say it was reckless, it was stupid, it was the emotional growth that I've got doing this and that I can pass on now to, like I said, my loved ones, my work colleagues, my children, um, my family, is invaluable. Invaluable. And that's why I, I can stand here today and talk about it, because um, I've been there and I've done it, I've lived and breathed it. I haven't just read it in a book and go, oh, that, that makes sense. I've actually tried or trial and errored it, and it does work. So that was, uh, that was just part of it. Because I've done it so quick, I'm just going to show you a quick video of um, summiting and then being back down at Camp 3. So what I've done, I've done one, two, three, four summits, and then I bypassed Camp 4 and spent the night at Camp 3 before I went down to base camp where I packed my bags and got the hell out of there. But I just want you to see the toll that it took on my body at Camp 3. And when you see the actual, actual documentary, it really goes into how, uh, how badly it affected me physically um, and emotionally because I'm constantly in tears. I haven't shown you it um, right now because um, you'll see it when the documentary comes out. But this is me summiting, this next clip was me. I've summited and I've now bypassed Camp 4 and gone back down to Camp 3. It's been, I think it's been like a 17, 18 hour day. And here's me at Camp 3 resting 
before I then make my way back down to base camp and get the hell out of there. And obviously I had a good night's sleep and I was like, no, I've got the third highest mountain to come here. Um, <laughs> but as you can see, and I wanted to really bring out the emotional side of this documentary, of this climb. I didn't expect it to be like this. I just expected me to go in there and go, yeah, I've done that, I've done that, I've done K2. But it, it shocked me to the point where I felt really uncomfortable documenting it, but I thought it's so important to document this side of the emotional intelligence because it's, um, you know, you see how raw it is, see how real it is, see how powerful it is, ultimately. And there I'm like, I'm done. And I meant that in my head, I'm like, I'm done with mountains, I'm done with mountains. And then I got back down to base camp, um, trekked out of there, which was horrendous as well because I needed to catch a flight. <laughs> so the time restraints were against me. But um, you can see in 19 days, you know, the first, day, the first day I arrived at base camp when you saw me walking around. So that was 19 days later. And you can just see I've aged, I did age about 20 years. I've lost about, I think I lost about four, four stone or three and a half stone. Need to fork stone, yeah. So I went there quite, and I was just like decrepit. And um, it was it was the hardest thing that I've done today, uh, bar none. So I'm super privileged to be able to show you this, and this won't be out for another six months. So um, when you do see it, it really dives deep into the emotional side of it, and you see quite a lot of tears. But I, I try and explain it as I'm going through it. So I think it's really important that you break down the emotions when they present themselves. Because the moment you don't and you lock it away, that's when, that's when trouble will come, come and find you. And that's when they will take charge and do what the fuck they want. And that is not a good thing. So really important that when they present itself, understand yourself. Take it, doesn't matter how tired or, or exposed you are, take it, try and understand it. And guess what you've got? got people around you, positive people around you who can help um, really understand those emotions, your emotions. Do not lock them away. Just because you've been through that experience once, do not lock it away. Do not limit yourself. Uh, understand about yourself. I promise you capability will come in and then self-belief will kick in the back end. And the biggest gift I believe that you can give to anyone is yourself, is your life experience, because that's ultimately all that we can leave behind. And there's two things I always say to my children and before we go on to how much I owe um, with my young Will over there, you're going to skip me out. Um, I always say to my children, there's no growth in comfort. Just remember that, there's no growth in comfort. And also, the state of your life is a reflection of your state of mind. So make it a positive one. It doesn't matter, you can have nothing, but you can still be happy and positive. It doesn't matter, success is in the, the eye of the beholder. Success isn't anything materialistic. Yes, there's the, the game of life that you have to play, but there's the eternal game. And if you can pass that on, because ultimately, that's ultimately all that we can really pass on through life.